good afternoon. Um, from the University of Southampton, that is my employer. Um, but um, they're a very nice employer. I, I train teachers there and I have a, a number of PhD students who are researching e-learning and um, computer programming and various things like that um, as well. But they're a very nice employer uh, because they allow me to spend some time working for an organisation called Computing at School. Uh, Computing at School is a volunteer, voluntary group and um, uh, they enable me to volunteer to do lots of things, so I spend lots of time at the weekends working uh, on their stuff as well. I was very fortunate about, oh goodness knows, getting on for 30 years ago, I walked into uh, an interview for a job as Head of Special Education in a, one of the local secondary schools, one of Hampshire's secondary schools, and they said, uh, we're getting our first computer. Are you interested? And um, that interview, you will say yes. <laughs> and that was my downfall. So I started off as a primary school teacher. That was a, my third job I was going for as uh, effectively a Senko, but arriving at the same time as their first computer, which was a Commodore PET computer. Anyone remembers that? So I know there's a few people in the room that were will remember those days. Uh, it's a solid white object, built-in screen, built-in cassette recorder for putting your programs into the um, computer. And my, they were called slow learners in those days, uh, my pupils were the pupils who were programming that computer. They were also using it for games, they were using it for learning, spelling activities, but they were programming it. Um, at the same time, I, I did then volunteer very shortly after that to take, do a CSE uh, computer studies course with pupils and, uh, and a uh, O-level course. Just how long ago it was. I've got to remember these names of courses now. And, um, and they were successful. And they were computer programming. And it kind of disappeared from our curriculum. Um, as the years went by, special educational needs in my life became less important in computing and uh, using computing technology became more and more important. Um, but the ICT curriculum kind of lost all of the stuff that those kids could do. And, those, those, and, and they were, there was something wrong as far as I was concerned. The next portion of the well, quite a few fortunate things in my life, but eight years ago, I, there was a group of people in Cambridge getting together, the mostly <coughs> commercial people and a few people from higher education, and the teachers there were from, higher, uh, from further education and the A-level courses. They were getting together to talk about the problems we had. And one of my colleagues at Warwick University couldn't go and suggested my name and I went along there and there's 17 of us around the table and that's what the fortunate thing was actually the beginnings of an organisation called Computing at School. If you haven't heard of Computing at School, by the end of today you will definitely know all about Computing at School. But as a result of that we've had things coming out. Why was that group so worried? Well, the number of people wanting to do a computing at university was falling. The number of women at university was minimal. The number of people wanting to do A level ICT was in the number of people wanting to do A level computing was falling. And there was a people weren't doing the right, weren't wanting to do those things. Why was Google and Microsoft sat around that table, or representatives of Google and Microsoft sat around that table? Because they were worried. They needed to employ people and there were not enough people, or they forecast not enough people, able to do it. To, um, to do the sort of work that they wanted to do, to do the programming. There was another imperative developed of, after a couple of meetings that the government was worried. 
what happens to, in commercial organisations when they haven't got enough computing power in this country? They work to the Indian subcontinent to many enough people in this country to support computers that the police service use, that the National Health Service use. Are we going to subcontract that work out to another authority? What about Cheltenham, GCHQ? Are we going to subcontract that out to some Indian company? <coughs> of course not. The country was de is dependent upon us having enough people um, who can do that sort of work. So that, that was an imperative. The imperative being we didn't have enough people wanting to do computer science. But actually, why are we worried, certainly in primary education, with that? Because let's face it, it's going to be a small percentage of our pupils will, that will go that way. But when we started looking at the problems was that the reason why pupils weren't choosing it was that they seemed to be having a less good experience of it and not choosing it like they would choose geography or they might choose to do history because they liked the subject. And that there was a Royal Society um, in report um, drawn up looking at the issues of what was happening in schools with ICT. And the conclusions from that were that a lot of pupils did ICT and they were bored with it because they could do better things on the computers. Those people who did ICT and liked it, in other words, doing the word processing, the presentation, the graphics and that sort of thing, those pupils then... Um, when they went on to do, do computing or cho cho chose a computing option, suddenly thought, well, this isn't the subject I wanted to do. I don't want to do programming. So we had people that were choosing the subject who really didn't want it, and those people who could do it had already been turned off it, so wouldn't do it, even though they had the skills to do it. Okay. The Royal Society report said we need to do something about that. The national curriculum was um, at a stage when it was being reviewed and that review is what we have been presented with uh, last September to begin. And it's for all pupils. Now, now I've said that, I think I need to justify why we need to do it in the primary school. Um, here's a receipt. It's a genuine receipt, it's a scan of a receipt and blown up. Okay, the top line of it, someone will just nod their head because they can say, it says that, that wines, um, sorry, 12 bottles of red wine at 9.99. How much does that come to? 12 bottles at 9.99. Come on, come on. Yeah, okay, well, it's quite an easy sum, isn't it? Because it's, uh, it's 12 at 10 pounds and then take away the 12 pence. Okay, so 119 pounds 88. And you track down, and how much did the person who put those 12 bottles of wine in their trolley have to pay for those bottles of wine? And down there, it's 18 pounds <laughs> for 12 bottles of wine. Have a look at the date, it was a couple of years ago. And why? Why did they get away with it? Why did hundreds of people get away with it? This incident, just one incident out of many that go on almost on a daily basis, was reported in the Daily Telegraph. Big spread. Tesco wines, blunder, bottles of wine for £1.50. Um, it's because the pe people who are working in the shops don't know about working through an algorithm. They didn't understand or didn't perceive the consequence of putting two different offers on at the same time. And the consequence was you could walk into the shop and if you bought a bottle of wine that originally was £11, the algorithm didn't work out and you were still paying something like £8 or £9 for that bottle of wine. Something Tesco's could suffer because they, they're trying to promote their, their products. If you bought a bottle of wine that was just under the 9.99 mark, the, the offer didn't part of the offer didn't apply. So again, the discount wasn't very much. It was just a combination of a couple of things. 
So it's an understanding the algorithm part. Um, there is a bit of ICT in this, something about to do with digital literacy. Perhaps Tesco's did this on purpose, because actually they got themselves in the Daily Telegraph, for, and it's effectively selling Tesco's, because Tesco's make mistakes on their wine. Let's go to Tesco's to buy our wine. Um, we don't know that, do we? But, um, but the algorithm's important, that people understand how an algorithm works and that it can follow it through and follow it through for its consequences for different, in this case, different numbers. But algorithms don't have to be numbers, uh, based on numbers. Algorithms can be based on actions. Make a cup of tea or make a jam sandwich are the classic algorithms we introduce uh, pupils to them. Okay. I'm now, I've, got, I've only got two slides. Let's have a look at this one. In the centre of there is the barefoot poster for computational thinking. Top left-hand corner, it says that computer programming is not important. If you feel at all anxious that you've got to introduce computer programming as the first step of introducing the new computing curriculum, that's wrong. The most important thing, and it's in the first line of the national curriculum, and my second slide will quote it, um, it talks about computational thinking. It's the central part of the new national curriculum. It's trying to get pupils to think in a more logical, systematic way. The centre part of that slide is the barefoot poster. Barefoot is, uh, was a programme, a project that ran from previous April to this April just gone. Um, it was funded in part by the DfE, to a great extent by Google and Microsoft, to en enable people to create teaching resources for the primary school. Now, Barefoot still does exist. If you go to your local Barefoot Centre, which happens to be Winchester's Science Centre, they will be able, are empowered to get people to come out to see you, to talk to you in your schools about the Barefoot materials uh, and about computing in general. So there's a plug for them. Barefoot uh, created this image of a representation of computational thinking. If you walk into a university and say to people, what's computational thinking? That's a good argument. It'll take several hours to tr and no one will agree. There's all sorts of elements to computational thinking, which is great fun. What we were doing was working with real teachers in real classrooms, creating real materials, and we came down to a set of words which we're agreed within kind of UK primary education and it's gone further. Uh, I was able to talk in Brussels to a group of educationalists from around Europe and they think what we say in computational thinking is seems to be fitting with the way in which they want to promote computational thinking. One of the things on there was uh, algorithm. Another one is decomposition. We need pupils to be able to look at complex problems and we need them to have strategies for sol to dealing with those problems. And decomposition is one of those uh, strategies. Decomposition is looking at something and breaking it out up into its component parts, but not losing any of the detail of it. So for some things, that's what they have to do. Give a pupil a model, uh, a Lego model of an aeroplane and say, what are the different parts? Well, the wings can be taken off and the fuselage and the tail, and those are the component parts, but you're not losing the detail of those component parts. And that's called decomposition. Abstraction is a different way of looking at things. Abstraction is taking a complex thing and then representing it in a simpler format so that you can understand it. So this same aeroplane, an abstraction of that aeroplane, may be a simple line drawing with the fuselage, one wing times two, and a tail. So that's an abstraction. It's taking something that's highly complex and representing it in a simple format. For instance, the City of London is a highly complex place, with all this built, etc. If you wanted to travel on the tube, what do you do? You get the best abstraction there is, the tube map. It's taking away all of the complexity that's unnecessary and just giving you the information that you need to travel on the tube. Yeah. So 
the tube map is a classic abstraction, and if you need to explain abstraction to someone, just give them that as an example of it. On the, on the barefoot model of um, computational thinking, we've got this thing called patterns. In the secondary school, they'll be calling them generalizations, uh, and some people call them patterns and generalizations. It's the same thing. What we need the pupils to do is to be able to look at a situation, look at a, another situation, and, tr and make the comparison and see if they can identify where things are the same. So a classic example in Key Stage 3 programming is that we'd ask them to create a, a database system for the, the, the school library. We might ask them to create a, a, a database system for a local video lending library. They would write, could look at that code and write the code as two separate programs, but actually it's the same program. It's just trying to get a general, a generic version of that. So it's identifying what things are in common. Um, the, the object, uh, Dan, the object. What's this? Sorry, I can't. What is this? What is it? You, you, yeah, a plate will be fine. The fact that you then went on to dish, but you, we have all got an innate ability to generalise. When you look at something, we may not have seen it before. No one's seen that style of plate before. Well, some people might have, but yeah. But we all immediately generalise. We find the common thing about it. So if someone presents to you an unusual chair, you, you recognise it as being a chair because there's something about it that... That's generalisation. What we're trying to do... Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very kind. Um, um, what we're trying to do is get pupils to look at complex situations and try and find the things that are in common and identify those things that they can go, oh, that is that sort of, uh, that sort of activity, that sort of object. Uh, we have got, um, uh, oh, the, the lowest, uh, the, the, the bottom one there is evaluation. In computing, we evaluate in a particular way. It's in English, we'll be evaluating in a particular way. Um, the particular way for computing is uh, threefold. If you go onto the barefoot materials, they'll give you lots of examples you can use with the pupils. Um, one is that we use criteria to evaluate. Does this thing meet the criteria, this thing that we made, meet the criteria that was specified in the beginning? Does it meet the spec? And it's a way of judging. So you could get, when they're doing peer assessment or doing self-assessment, you could give them the criteria. So you're going to create this, you're going to do this, you're going to make the blue bot uh, travel around the mat to do a particular thing. Does their program meet the criteria? It's one form of evaluation. It's a very precise, logical form of evaluation. The other form is heuristics. Uh, that is general rules of thumb. Does the solution that they produced meet the general ideas that we have about a good solution? So they have to have this concept in their heads of what a good solution is, and we give them those concepts. We say, for instance, if they're designing uh, a page, a screen page, a web page for, of themselves, uh, we talk about the colours that are being used. Uh, are they too gaudy? Are they, um, do they blend well to, with each other? Is the writing big enough to be read? That's, those are heuristics, the, the general rules of thumb. And the third one are user needs. This product that they've produced, uh, whether it's a, a, a short computer program to do something with a um, aroma or whatever, or whether it's a, a piece of, uh, it's an app they've generated for their phone, user needs are, does it meet the, what is the needs of the specified user? Uh, we used to have a sense of your audience as one of the phrases in the ICT curriculum. It's, it's the same sort of thing. Do them making judgments about whether that is a worthwhile activity. Okay, I was going to talk to you, but I got distracted a little bit, about Piaget, uh, sorry, De Bono's hats. 
Many of you are familiar with De Bono's hats. We've got a great debate on at the moment. De Bono had six hats uh, reflecting six different ways of thinking. The debate is, is computational thinking a different coloured hat or is it a rainbow hat made up of all the different aspects of the De Bono uh, hats? So those of you who are using De Bono in your classrooms uh, already could make that link to computational thinking. So you could you make, a, make a different coloured hat and say we're doing computational thinking today and we're, talk we're going to be breaking things down into its component parts or we're going to be making representations that are less complex, that are easier to understand, or we might be making an algorithm, a sequence of events. Oh, algorithm, there's two sorts of algorithms. One is that sequence of events, making the jam sandwich. The other is a set of rules. So imagine go, trying to get around a maze. You might have an algorithm which is a sequence, a set of events to work your way around the maze. You might have a set of rules for working your way around any maze. So it's always hug the left-hand wall. So you keep going around hugging the left-hand wall. And I promise you, you will get out of a maze unless there's certain mazes that you don't get out of. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that's the, the challenging bit of work. That's the challenging bit of work. Okay, uh, hopefully um, uh, the, these are the things to remember as you walk away. Down at the bottom, barefoot computing. If, you're not a mem if you've not been to the barefoot site, go to the barefoot site. You have to log in. It's free. You just have to give your email address so that, um, uh, and you, you'll have a password to get into there. Computing at schools. Barefoot is a subset of computing at school. You can join computing at school. Again, it's free. You just have to um, present credentials. Uh, you have to give the name of your school, etc. The point about Barefoot, every primary school teacher can get something from it because you can go into there and get some resources for whatever it is that you're te teaching and those resources have been produced professionally by classroom teachers. If you go to, into computing at school, A, it's got all the secondary, further education people, university people in there as well. Um, it's a community... Uh, based uh, area and people are putting resources up there but there's no in a sense little uh, quality assurance there are thousands of resources up there but certainly if you're responsible for computing in your school for coordinating the computing in your school and you need um, some support and you want local contacts you go to computing at school Computing at school helps organise the local hubs and the hub meetings. So again, go into there, you can find out where the support groups are in the area uh, to attend those. Network of excellence. Uh, Dan was a master, he's a master teacher uh, of computing. The network of excellence has got many master teachers around uh, and we're going to be getting several more in the Southampton area based at the University of Southampton. Um, there's a reminder about the, the quote of the national curriculum, the first line, a high quality computing education Re, you, to use comp computational thinking. Um, what else on there? If you know any adult who is not yet a teacher who wants to teach computing, please let me know. They just have to have a degree, English and Maths, GCSE, and we will train them to be a computing teacher. We've got courses, pre-courses, as well as the initial teacher training courses for doing that. So please, we are desperate for computing teachers. And that's it. Oh, computer programming is really important. Why? Because it's one of the best ways of demonstrating computational thinking. So I said it's not the most important thing, but it's a really good strategy for teaching computational thinking. Okay, I've finished. <laughs> Whichever one of these. <laughs>